that, Frame Raider. April 14th, 2024. The 20th anniversary of Sirius Sam Advance. What makes Climax's portable spin-off worth celebrating? Not much individually. It's more so my personal experience that makes it special. This isn't just the first Serious Sam game I ever played, but also my earliest exposure to a first-person shooter. Fascinated by the concept, I fully immersed myself in what I would later discover to be a pretty weak example of the genre. Don't just take my word for it. You can still find old reviews of the game that trashed it on release. So, why did people dislike Serious Sam Advance? Well, to the uninformed, the concept of a first-person shooter on this limited platform may anticipate a subpar experience. The bar is already set low, then after the first few seconds of gameplay, you'll notice some glaring flaws. Like the frame rate, for example, which isn't great. As a result, the player's movement can feel jerky. Consider that along with the confusing crosshair system, which has to individually recognize targets in order to land successful shots. Even then, their hitboxes won't register unless you're facing them head-on. To many, this game is a disaster from the get-go. It might completely taint your opinion of a shooter on this platform. On the contrary, there are a few great shooters on GBA like the Doom ports and Duke Nukem Advance. The frame rate's decent, your crosshair doesn't need to recognize enemies to shoot them, and the controls are solid. These all came out years before Serious Sam Advance, so what went wrong here? Maybe we can find some answers by taking a closer look at its development. Thanks to a game preservationalist, Andrew Borman, we have a few concepts and gameplay videos from earlier prototypes, most of which were compiled several years before release. According to the game's composer, Matt Simmons, development of Serious Sam Advance began in 2001. Andrew Borman says in one of his prototype videos that it was scheduled for a late 2002 release. The earliest content we have are edited mock-ups to demonstrate what the game could eventually look like. First was a top-down shooter. Seeing as how Smash TV was one of Serious Sam's earliest inspirations, this could have been a good idea. The second mock-up was a first-person shooter, akin to the final game. Notice how the rocket launcher here behaves like a machine gun? Even for a mock-up, that's really strange. The menu for these prototypes calls the game Serious Sam the First GBA Encounter. Interesting. I suppose they had sequels in mind? Now isn't that something? There was at one point a toggleable map like the auto map from Doom. I bet that would have been useful for finding secrets. To this day, we don't know if they've all been found. More on that later. Borman makes an effort in his videos to describe the game's attention to detail, which I feel has been undersold over the years. Serious Sam Advance doesn't look great, no, but what GBA shooter does, really? And some of these textures are quite detailed, though they do look kinda weird at a distance. But returning to this pre-release gameplay, I noticed a couple differences. Fairly typical stuff as far as these things go. The HUD is closer to the first encounters. The Colt sprites are closer to the PC original. The double-barreled shotgun animation is different. And there's also a different death animation for the wearable. Something interesting to note regarding the final game's files, there's an unused icon for Colt ammo. In the end, this weapon became unlimited. Strange how this icon exists, yet the final Colt icon is a shotgun shell case? Must have been a mistake. It's hard to say why Serious Sam Advance turned out the way it did. We can see that it was in development for a pretty long time, too. Initially, I thought Climax's home console game Next Encounter might have interfered with its development. However, according to the manuals, Next Encounter was made by Climax Solent, and Advance was made by Climax London. Either way, they both released on April 14th, 2004. So in all likelihood, this was a deadline for both projects. The state of Serious Sam Advance as it was released isn't very good, and nobody will dispute that. But there is a decent game behind all the jank. So, let's take a look at it. First and foremost, what's the story this time? By cross-referencing the in-game and manual story, we can piece together a bigger picture. It begins by telling us that Sam has returned to the time lock and traveled back to his original time period. Uh, why? His mission was to confront and defeat Mental. Mental's still alive, so what happened to that? Meanwhile, scientists have deciphered more inscriptions from the tombs of Egypt, revealing hidden functionalities of the time lock. Now they're able to send teams back in time to previously inaccessible locations. 
These research missions went on for two years without issue, until eventually, the team stopped responding. The world leaders decide to send Sam back into the time lock to figure out what's going on. As it turns out, Mental has been sending his hybrid monsters into various time periods throughout history to corrupt the timeline. What that means precisely is unexplained, but gives weight to the existing theory that every game in this series is canon. In both the game and the manual, it says that Sam's mission begins in ancient Rome, except the game actually starts in Egypt. You do later end up in Rome, but only after a time lock malfunction. Perhaps in earlier development, Rome was the first chapter, but who knows. The game wraps up with Sam defeating the final boss, then jumping back into the time lock. Roll credits. Rewind! Alright, so the first level of the game is called the Temple of Hercat Upper, followed by the lower half underground. The environments in Serious Sam games usually reflect real-world places, and while this area certainly fits the Egyptian vibe, I don't think the Temple of Hercat actually exists? didn't stop them from writing detailed lore about it. Known for its bloody sacrifices, this temple was once the focal point of a perverse ancient Egyptian cult. The eating of living hearts was believed to give the priests eternal life. Okay. This is the Natrixa message board, which only shows once before entering a new level. It gives you lore, gameplay stats, and tips. You can also see exclusive weapon and enemy renders here, but only after you've encountered them. Speaking of, most enemies have a blurb in their description about the dangers of being within close range, like noxious skin or exploding their internally stored rockets. Whatever that means. The problem is, there's a close range weapon in this game, being the chainsaw. It doesn't do much damage, so you're more likely to die using it than to actually kill anything. It's basically worthless. <laughs> Two shots kills a kamikaze. That's normal. But this only happens if you selected the tourist difficulty. If you selected normal or hard, enemies will take considerably more shots to kill. That's not how difficulty usually works in Serious Sam. If you want an authentic experience here, just choose the tourist setting. Inside this room here, you can find a secret double-barreled shotgun behind a wall. How would you know about this? Well, Natrixa did give us a hint earlier in the strategic data section. But the only way to actually find it is by hugging walls, which goes for most of Sam Advance's secrets. It's quite possible that we haven't even found them all. These are the secrets that we know of. This double-barreled shotgun. This Tommy gun in Hercat Lower. This rocket launcher in Aemon Thul. I remember finding that one by accident. And one of two existing 200 health overcharge items in the Slave Compound which you collect by shimmying between these two columns, flicking a switch, then passing through a newly unlocked door. Again, that prototype toggleable map would have really helped here, instead of relying on the player to hug random walls. Then there's this goofball, the Methug Soldier. You can read the descriptions yourself if you want. Basically, Sam Advance has a bunch of strange new monsters, and a few of them are actually pretty good. I like the Cyclops. They fit in quite well with the Egyptian setting. The Hermit Crabuloids are cool. They hide at a distance, so you can only shoot them up close when they come out of their shells. Gunrillas are awesome! Giant gorilla-like creatures with a huge cannon replacing their heads. It's creative! Kamikazes aren't much of a threat in this game unless other creatures are actively running towards you. All you have to do is circle strafe around them, and they'll never catch up. Circle strafing is intended, by the way. Both the manual and the Trixa point that out. So, I'm not sure how they didn't notice this. Oh, and you can get the wearables to circle around you indefinitely. Pardon the crusty footage, that's from a GameCube recording. Speaking of the wearables, they're another reason why people near immediately put this game down. At the end of the first level, there's an arena where two wearables spawn. In the original games, these things charge at you, then take a moment to readjust their position. In Serious Sam Advance, they'll charge at you, and charge at you, and charge at you. That's all they do from the moment you're seen. Then if one hits you, the player is forcefully pushed backwards for a couple seconds. Not too unlike the original games, but those had vertical space. So on GBA, you just end up getting stuck on whatever's behind you. The effect lasts for a few seconds until the player can freely move again. Even if you kill the wearable in the meantime, you're still stuck. Worst part? You've only got a pistol! Sure, you can get the double-barreled shotgun, but you're not likely to find that on your first run. 
This is an atrocious fight, and honestly, I can't even blame people for giving up here. Whether you like Serious Sam Advance or not, you gotta admit, this soundtrack's not bad at all. It was actually more advanced during development, but had to be scaled back due to technical limitations. You can listen to the full, original renditions of these tracks on Matt Simmons' SoundCloud page. As a bit of added trivia, there's this one guy named Yusup Dalmaz, who goes around claiming various Japanese soundtracks on YouTube. If you upload a playthrough of this game, the copyright system will flag the music as from some Japanese Sailor Moon game. This Yusup guy's since created playlists for this supposed game on both Spotify and Apple Music. It's kind of interesting because it seems as if he's deliberately downgraded them to resemble the NEC PC-88 system, which was certainly... an effort? But they don't belong to him. I contacted Matt Simmons to see if there was some kind of actual confusion here, but nope, this dude's just a big old liar. And it seems like he's been getting away with it for quite some time, too. It's a pretty weird situation that I only recently learned about. I thought it was kind of interesting. But anyways, back to the script. <laughs> For some reason, arachnoids sound like horses now? At one point, this actually made sense to me. Serious Sam Advance and Serious Sam 2 were both in the same bargain bin at my local store, and this was before I knew anything about either games. Seeing the arachnoid on the back of Advance and a centaur on the back of 2, I figured these creatures were one in the same. Makes me wonder if Climax London also thought this somehow. <laughs> We're now two levels in and haven't yet encountered some staple mark creatures in this series, like the Gnar and Clear Skeleton. Truth is, they're absent from the game. My guess for the Clears is that they're a bit hard to animate in 2D. As per the Gnars, I don't know. Climax doesn't seem to like them very much. Just before a level starts, you get this map screen, showing an overview of the place that you're headed. For the Egypt chapter, most of these icons depict levels from the first encounter. So here's that earlier mentioned secret rocket launcher, and this thing is... weird. The projectile takes a moment to leave the rotator, which likely wasn't intentional. If you move while firing, it'll launch in the direction you're facing a quarter second later. Keep this in mind or else you'll miss your shots. In some situations, that could prove fatal. It is after all an explosive weapon. Some levels later, and you're faced with the first of two boss fights. The Syrian Sphinx! From Syria, I guess? In the Sirius Sam series, there's a race of aliens called the Syrians, which are spelt like this. I'm assuming that's what was meant here? This fight is nothing special. The Sphinx simply fires at you, then spawns enemies a few moments later. You can defeat him before that happens by firing your minigun the moment it spawns in. This is the case for both boss fights, in fact. I prefer not using the automatic weapons here to keep the challenge, but if you don't care about the boss fights, you can basically skip them by doing this. The Egypt chapter overall is rather tame. It's the Rome chapter where the game starts to pick up speed. Levels reaching the end of the game are genuinely challenging. Most of that challenge has to do with the introduction of Gunrillas, though, which replace the common Cyclops. Something else replaced is the Tommy Gun ammo, which now appears slightly rusted for no discernible reason. Check out this collisionless wall in the Slave Quarters level. Behind it is a small out-of-bounds room, which if you walk back far enough in, will spawn random enemies. But moments later, the game crashes. Here's the Rogue Prion Gun. Most, including myself, once thought this weapon did nothing but add a question mark to your enemies' heads. Or lack thereof. However, it activates enemy infighting. If there are no enemies around, then they'll just spin in circles. It takes a good while for an enemy to actually kill another, so it's still rather useless. The probable reason that most think this weapon doesn't work at all is because certain enemies seem to be immune to it. This includes Reptiloids, which are the first enemies you'll encounter after picking it up. Really makes you wonder if this game was ever playtested. Alright, in contrast, here's a pretty cool weapon, the Time Strike. It's a button that lets Sam deploy an assortment of heavy items from the future, which slam on top of enemies. Truly one of the greatest weapons ever created for this series, and it's stuck on the Game Boy Advance. 
the cannons in this game. Remember how its balls would bounce off the ground because physics? Well, in Serious Sam Advance, they float midair and reflect off the walls. It is remarkably strange. Anyways, you now have quite an arsenal of weapons, but switching with the B button only moves the selection forwards. Something you'll need to learn is how to switch backwards, which is by holding B and pressing the L button. That's explained in the manual. Maybe as an Atrixa gameplay hint too? Not sure, they seem to be selected at random. One that is for sure, however, is the slow movement option by holding B while moving. It claims to help the player with aiming, and it does. But the only time it's really necessary is the godforsaken end to the pre-final level, where they put a bunch of lava pits everywhere. During typical gameplay, usually you're sliding all over the place to line your enemies up with the crosshair. But you can hardly do that in this situation without falling into the pits. So you're better off using this slow aiming tactic to ever so slightly nudge the crosshair to where it needs to be. If you're unlucky enough that an enemy falls into one of those pits, guess what? They don't die. And in these rooms, each kill is essential to progress. The worst part is how this is pretty common, though usually it's just kamikazes, which you can still blow up by getting close enough to the pit. Although this does inflict damage, and with the fight that comes immediately after, you don't want that. Also, yes, this game has a life system, though it hardly matters since with a game over, all you need is the level password to continue. These are single words shown on the bottom left of the entry screen, which are a bit random. Slave Compounds is Bobbins, the Gladiator Training School is Coinage, the Bathhouse is Need, like what, you need a bath? Sometimes on this level, Natrixa will show a gameplay hint implying there's a secret somewhere. Maybe there is, but I could never find it. My theory is that it's the final weapon, the unidirectional microwave transmitter, which is this game's version of the Sirius Bomb. Reason I think that is because it's the only weapon you don't have yet, and also, if you enter the password for the following level, it magically appears in your inventory, despite it's not traditionally available until the final level. This thing uses modified sprites of the second encounter flamethrower, which is an odd choice. When you pick it up, there's a weird hum that plays for a few seconds. My guess is there was meant to be an exclusive sound here, but it doesn't play right for some reason. Oh, hello! Haven't seen you for a while. These are the only four Cyclops in ancient Rome. Bit of a callback, I guess? Certainly unexpected. Unless it was a mistake, that's a real possibility. Here's an iconic moment of the game, for anyone who's played it anyways, where kamikaze spawn one by one in each corner of the room. Like all the other enemies, you can't kill them while they're spawning in, so you'll have to wait a moment, thus you spend a lot of this fight waiting. But it does get pretty intense as the spawns pick up speed. Enemies can actually spawn kill you if you stand in their spot at the wrong time. This isn't likely to happen during a regular playthrough as they usually spawn quite far from the player, but I've had it happen a couple times. Here's the final boss, the Wolfiator. It's basically a duplicate of the Sphinx boss, but its attack splits in three. Also, it summons a different roster of enemies, including those nasty Gunrillas. Using the UMT against them is highly encouraged. The Wolfiator has an Atrixa icon, which is never shown in-game as there'd need to be another level to activate the message board. There's also probably an Atrixa description somewhere in the game's files, but as far as I know, nobody's found that yet. The Wolfiator's wound sound effect is shared with the water elemental from Sirius Sam's Alpha. It's probably a coincidence. After all, the game uses a lot of stock sound effects, and chances are that's just another one. Once the Wolfiator's health bar depletes, this happens. Pretty wild for a Game Boy Advance game. Pick up the level ending onk as usual, and that's it. Serious Sam Advance. Once you've had enough with single player, you can try out the multiplayer deathmatch mode, which is playable with up to four people. However, you would need four systems, four carts, and a bunch of link cables. I wouldn't recommend that, as this mode is as basic as can be. Do also consider that you're still at the mercy of that weird targeting system. 
so if you thought it was hard to aim at slow-moving enemies, now try against a human player. Perhaps doable with projectile weapons, but those have all been disabled here. You can't use anything above the minigun. One interesting thing about multiplayer is that it has an exclusive power-up. Now that's some serious power. But that's about it. Although most forgot about Serious Sam Advance shortly after release, a few fans have helped in extending its legacy. Nivia Yuki has been working on a ROM hack that he calls Serious Sam Advance Gold Edition. It's the same game, but with a variety of new graphics and sound changes. There's also a full Serious Engine 1 remake that's been in the works for years, but it's been stuck in hiatus for a while, as the main developer doesn't have much free time. What we've seen of it is very impressive, though. I hope this comes out someday. Stay tuned for an eventual pre-release study of Climax's other Serious Sam game, Next Encounter. I've talked about it before, but we know far more about its development now than we ever have in the past. So, I'll see you when that comes out. And for now, take care everyone.